from inside the warehouse at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, it is the Masson All Access Podcast. Brendan Mortensen joined by Tim Leonard and former number one overall pick, current Orioles broadcaster Ben McDonald. And Ben, through your playing career, through your broadcasting career, I would have to imagine that this appearance on the podcast has to be the pinnacle of everything you've done. <laughs> well, well, we'll wait and judge it just as soon as we're done, but I have a feeling it's going to be top five for sure. Oh, it has to be. It has to be. So... We have some questions from me and Tim. We're also, if you're following along on Facebook and YouTube, we're going to be taking some fan questions. We had Kevin Brown on here a few weeks ago, and he got every question from his favorite food spot in Baltimore to his favorite Super Smash Bros. character. Mm. So really could be any questions here I'm from ready. fans. I may not be able to answer it, but, but I'm <laughs> ready anyway. Well, you gave it the old college try. So uh, I'll, I'll start with one here. Obviously, you came up in your career very quickly to the big leagues, and we're seeing some young players have success on the O's right now yeah. with Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson. How impressive is it to see those young guys having as big of an impact as they've been having? And as somebody who came up very quickly through the system, how much of a challenge is that to jump up that quickly? You know, it's always a challenge. Uh, you know, you know, we, we say Adley's young. He's not really young. He's young as far as big league experience goes. He's 24 years old. Take into consideration Juan Soto's 23 and he's in his fifth year of big league baseball. Right. Okay, so Adley's still kind of young age-wise, but he's definitely young to the big league level. But since Adley's come up, it's been very impressive. Like his swing decisions for me, uh, everything we heard about him, everything we thought we hoped that we would get behind home plate with putting down the right fingers or now these days pushing the right buttons on the pitch comm system, um, his blocking ability, his throwing ability, his handling of a pitching staff, swing decisions at home plate, the ability to take a walk, the ability to drive the ball the other way have been been super impressive at everything I think we could have hoped for. He's been outstanding. Gunnar Henderson now is young. He's 21 years old, uh, drafted, you know, of course, after the pick, after Adley Rushman in 2019, right out of high school. Um, look, it's uh, – I don't want to get too excited. I don't want to get too excited about this kid because it's only a sample size. But I'm going to tell you what – his ability and his approach at home plate is very advanced. Like, you don't see many 21-year-olds come to the big league level at the highest level and be able to drive the ball to the opposite field. But when I asked about it, he said, look, this is how my dad taught me to hit. This is how I grew up hitting is using the opposite field. His dad taught him well. His dad was well, well beyond his years as well. Now he's starting to get these man muscles now. Like, he's only 21, <laughs> but, like, if you've ever sat down and talked to him, like, He's 6'4", yeah, 210 right dude. now. Yeah. Yeah. You could see this body projecting in about four years when he really becomes a man uh, at 6'4", 225, 230, and he's going to you know get strong enough to where he'll take the ball on the inside part of the plate and still pull it, which I think he's close to doing that now. We don't know because the approach to him has been kind of middle off speed and a little bit away, but it's certainly been impressive. I love the arm going across the diamond. It's a big-time arm. His agility, his movement, his footwork in the infield, all advanced for 21 years old. Yeah, they got him bad in leadoff today, too. Yeah, I you saw see that. that. Which I think is cool. Um, what I mean, you come up, you're the number one pick. There's all of those expectations mm. on you. If you could go back in time and give a little piece of advice to yourself when you were at that stage, what piece of advice would you give? The biggest thing is don't try to live up to the expectations that people put on you. I, I think that's, you know, for me, I, I graded out as the highest amateur player in the history of the game coming out of college. Like, I, I scored the highest on whatever that grading system was. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it became a lot of expectations. I was the first overall pick in Oriole history. They had finished dead last the year before. So a lot of the expectations fell on me, you know, and, and I remember, and I loved Frank Robinson. He was my first manager, but I remember as a 22 year old, my first spring training, he calls me in. He goes, listen, if we got a chance to go to playoffs this year, you got to win 20 games. <laughs> and I looked at him like, yeah, no problem. I don't even know how to pitch. Like, I don't even know how to use my stuff at the big league level. This is my first full year at the big league level. And he said, you got to win 20 games. And so I tried to live up to those expectations. In college, my, my college coach called every pitch I ever threw. I could fast, yeah, I could do that. Breaking ball, yeah, I got one of those. Change up, I could do that. Fork ball, sure, I got one of those. High fastball, I can throw it there. But I never really understood how to set up hitters. I never understood why you throw a, fi a high fastball, then you bounce a breaking ball to dirt, or vice versa. I didn't realize that if you show the heater in to speed the bat up, the all-speed stuff away becomes a really good money pitch for you. I didn't understand those things. And all of a sudden, I go from college where he called every pitch to now I'm at the big league level. i got to call my own game. 
I've yeah. never done that before, and now I'm doing it against the best players in the world. Mm -hmm. And so it was a big adjustment period for me. There was a lot of times I went home as a 21-year-old at this level banging my head up against the wall wondering why I couldn't have success. And then you start to live up or try to live to the expectations, man. And it can. And I went through a bad way. There was a bad way for me in a while where I started to question – did I belong in the big leagues? Was this really for me? Uh, you know, all those kinds of things go through your mind. But thank gosh for Cal Ripken Jr. who kind of took me under his wing and he said, listen, everything's going to be fine. You, you show up to the ballpark every day. You work your tail off. You need innings. You need pitches in the big leagues. You need experiences. All you need. He said, I love your stuff. Then Rick Sutcliffe comes along my second year, and he was the other godsend for me. And – between those two guys and a lot of other people, my, my life and my ability got back on track. I got some experience at the big league level, and all of a sudden the light bulb started to flicker a little bit. Yeah, this is how you do this. Yeah, <laughs> because people told me how to have success, but it never really kicks in for you. I don't care what people tell you until you watch. You're doing what you're doing. You get on the air and you do it yourself. People can coach you. You can go to class. Those are great moments. But you never really learn until you put yourself in those situations. And I failed and I succeeded when I was on the mound, and those were the, the, the memories for me that really stuck, and all of a sudden my career began to take off like we wanted it to go. Yeah, so we talked with Gunnar Henderson over the last few seasons as we followed him throughout the minor leagues, and he struggled for a little bit mm. in the minors. People seem to forget that it wasn't you know just always the upward yeah. trajectory for Gunnar. And one of the things he told us was that going through those struggles probably helped him more than yeah. anything else in his minor league career. It sounds like you kind of felt a similar way. Yeah. You know, we always hear this statement that this game is built on failure, and it is. And Gunnar Henderson will struggle again. Right now he's off to a great – but trust me when I tell you this, they'll adjust to him. He'll have to adjust back again. That's what the big league game is about. He will struggle again, but it's fun to watch right now. But he's uber talented. But, yeah, I mean, struggles are part of the game. And I think depending on how you take them, you look at them – are they rough at the time? Absolutely. They're tough moments. But they can also make you tougher to realize, okay – this is what I need to do to succeed now. Okay, I went down this path. This didn't quite work. Let's take a step back. Let's move in this direction now. So you learn what it takes to succeed. You learn so much about the big leagues, not about just the on-the-field stuff, how to become a professional. How do you handle yourself off the field? What do you do in order to be successful? The right amount of sleep, the right food. All those things matter. There's a lot of things going through Gunnar Henderson's head right now about how to be a big leaguer. But I can tell you this, he's very mature for his age. Adley Rutschman very mature for his age, even though he's young still, young to the big leagues. I think these guys have their heads screwed on right. Uh, they're, they're hard workers. They've had a lot of success. They've been coached up. They've been coached the right way. And so, look, I'm excited about where coming from where we were three, four, five years ago to where we are now, man. It, it's like night and day. And, you know, I keep saying that, you know, you can finally see that light at the end of the tunnel. That, that light keeps getting brighter and brighter now. So it's been fun to watch. So you bring up Cal Ripken. Mm -hmm. I think when we hear his name, I'm sure you get it asked a tons of times, but you got a Cal Ripken story or maybe just talk a little bit about what he was like in the locker room when you were going through those struggles. Man, I got so many junior stories, it's crazy. <laughs> um, one of my favorites is I was pitching with a blister uh, here at Camden Yards. I think it was 93 or 94. And, man, I was going down and Richie Van Sales was putting – Stary uh, strips over my finger, which was illegal to do, but I had blood coming off of it. We were just trying. So Junior puts a bat and helmet on. It's like the sixth inning, you know. And he comes in like, what are you doing? I was like, man, I'm getting my finger taped up so I can go back out and pitch again. So Sutt's down there. Sutt down there. He looks at Junior. She said, well, let's just hit a home run so we can get him out of the game. It's a 1-1 game. You hit a homer, he's coming out of the game. Junior goes, okay. Walks up the home plate. First pitch, hits it for a home run. We take a two to one lead. I mm -hmm. pitch the next inning, come out, you know, and uh, and we end up winning the ball game two to one. That's one of my favorite stories. The other one, of course, is him calling pitches for me, and and it's in his book. He talked about it a lot in his book. And Chris Hoyles was a young catcher when I came up, and I didn't have a clue of what I was doing. Chris Hoyles was kind of learning the hitters and learning the game too, and. Man, we were head scratching after a game, and Junior just kind of sticks his head in. He, he looks in there at me and Chris. He goes, "You guys don't, you guys don't have a clue of what you're doing." I, I, I said, no, "No, no, sir, Mr. Ripken, I do not. I mean, I wasn't going to hide it from nobody. I do not have a clue of what I'm doing." So he said, "Listen, this is what we're going to do." And he sits down. He said, they, "But it's going to stay right here." Me, you, and Chris Hoyles, it stays in this triangle. He said, "If the pitching coach, the manager, or anybody else finds out about it, I'm done." Yes, sir, Mr. Ripken. <laughs> so all of a sudden, he starts the way he stands out at home at shortstop, where he held his glove off to his side. It was funny. I'm looking in and getting the signs at home plate, and I see Chris Hoyles is looking right over my shoulder because he's looking at the shortstop, and the way Junior held his glove was what pitch it was and the location. 
And then all of a sudden the fingers would go down. And that was my learning curve in the big league. So after the game was over, me, Junior, and Chris Hoyles would sit down with about a six-pack of beer, and <laughs> we would break down and we would talk about this is why we threw Paul Molitor this pitch in this situation. This is why I wanted to pitch Dave Winfield like this because this is what he likes to do in these situations. And I never realized all that. I was like, wow. So, Junior, you're telling me that I should pitch a guy differently with two out and nobody on that I would pitch him with two out and runners on second and third, he said, absolutely. And I went, oh, my gosh, I never thought about that. <laughs> because if you pitch a Hall of Fame guy like that or anybody the same way every time, he's going to get used to how you pitch him. But right. all of a sudden I learned, okay, Molitor comes to the plate. We're up three to three to one. It's the seventh inning. Nobody on, two out. Here, here's a good fastball for you to hit, Molitor. If you can hit it for a double in the right center field gap, take it. Here it is. Hit it. But – when it mattered the most and he had runners in scoring position and it was two out and it was a tight ball game, this is how we were going to pitch him. I went, man, I never thought about that. So that's what helped me learn a lot about the game was Cal Ripken Jr. And his knowledge of the game, everybody knew how smart he was, his positioning on defense well before there were shifts and all that kind of stuff really helped my maturing process. So here's kind of a, a weird hypothetical question that I'm not sure if you'll have a good answer for, but <laughs> – you know, obviously, when you were pitching, you were pitching in the '90s. Right now, it's a it's a much more analytically mm-hmm. driven game, especially for pitchers. We're sure. seeing a lot of starters. You know, we've seen guys like Corbin Burns have a ton of success with kind of the newer age of pitching, where it's a lot of cutters and sinkers. Do you think if you were making your debut right now, rather than when you made your debut, do you think you'd be a different pitcher given the information that's out there right now? Potentially, yeah. And but you know, you got to know that we didn't have that data. We didn't right. have spin rates. <laughs> you know, now 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 I look back on my time, and me, me and Rick Sutcliffe used to sit in the dugout, and Mike Massini would be on the mound, and all of a sudden he'd get a 2-0 count to a good fastball hitter, and he'd throw it 93-94 right down the middle of the plate, and the guy would pop it up or swing and miss it. And me and Sutt would look at each other and go, how the hell is he getting away with that? <laughs> you know, I, th- I would throw it 96 down the middle of that count, and it'd go 400 feet if I missed the spot. Right. Moose could throw it there, and now it all makes sense. I guarantee you, Moose had a high spin rate heater. It stayed on plane a little bit longer. It was a little bit of deception to it, and it just rode through the zone where my ball was coming down like a normal fastball. His just kind of stayed on plane a little bit longer. Even though I threw harder, Mm. he had more success with his fastball for those kinds of reasons. So we didn't have the analytical numbers. I often think about would it have changed the way I pitch and and my approach to the game if I knew more about how my stuff worked. Uh, Maybe it would have. Um, But – it's still about adjustments, and I always tell people we're in a, a, an unusual time right now where we're learning about pitching, and it's one thing to tell you, like if you walk in and I tell you what kind of stuff you got, and I say, listen, you can have success with your fastball to the upper part of the, of the quadrant of the strike zone. If you get it there, you'll have a lot of success, and if you throw your breaking ball down the way, you'll have success, but the old school thought of that is I still got to be able to tell you as a pitching coach mechanically how you can get those balls to those certain quadrants for you to have success. Yeah, even if you didn't have the underlying numbers. Right. So it's still, while we're in a new world, it's still a lot of old school stuff involved to where, yes, you have the knowledge of where you can be successful with your stuff in the zone, but you still got to be able to get the ball to those areas to have success. And that's where the old school of mechanics still come into play. Mm. So we got some listener questions here. One from Dave says, from a baseball perspective, what is one thing about Adley that the average fan might not realize? Mm. Just from his baseball skills? Yeah. And maybe if it's something, you know, leadership-wise, too, that could qualify, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, you know, Adley comes across as being a quiet guy when you talk to him. But I think the more that... He gets to know you and you get to know him. I think he opens up and, and he becomes a more vocal kind of dude. Now, what's been impressive about me is I was worried, for instance, he loves to meet the pitcher on the line when the mm-hmm. inning's over and they have that conversation. That always worked in college because I saw him do it in college too at Oregon State. I covered him at the College World Series for a couple of years and also saw him do it in the minor leagues. But I wondered how it would translate to big league level when a guy like Jordan Lyles, who's got 12 years of experience right. at the big league level, was Adley going to just bounce out there to the veteran <laughs> yeah. and meet him halfway? He did. And it showed me something about him. Like, he ain't, this is who he is. And it's not pretend. It's not fake. It's who he is. And I love that about him. It's like, this is what I've always done. I don't care if you got 10 years, 5 years, 20 years of service. 
this is what I'm going to do. This, this is what I do, you know. And so I think – and also I, I think another thing that strikes me, Adley, he is super athletic. Like, he is way more athletic than you think he is because yeah. you think of him as a catcher. Watch his footwork the next time. Watch how he fights when he blocks mm-hmm. balls. He doesn't square – he doesn't – his shoulders don't get out of whack. He fights hard to square his shoulders in forward lean. You see those balls just hit off his chest, and they stay right there in front of home plate. So, he's a lot more athletic than you think he is, too. So, here's another question on YouTube. This might be the hardest question of the day. The question <laughs> is Baltimore crabs or Ooh. Louisiana shrimp? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. You know, that, that – that's a tough one for me because I, <laughs> being from Louisiana, I'm a big seafood guy. It's right. crawfish, shrimp, crabs all the time. The difference, though, is at home we boil our water. We boil our seafood, rather. So yeah. we, we take the water and we season it with a powder seasoning. And when you boil it and you let it soak in the seasoning, it actually, the seasoning goes into the shrimp, the crabs, the crawfish, right. whatever. Up here, of course, everything is steamed for the most part with the Old Bay sprinkled on top. And so I wondered many moons ago how I would take to the steaming <laughs> uh, when I first got here as a 21-year-old. Absolutely loved it. But I will say this. I love crabs. I love shrimp no matter how they're prepared, but my favorite is still crawfish from okay. Louisiana. That's okay. that's my favorite seafood. So if you're making seafood, mm-hmm. are you making it Louisiana style or are you making it Baltimore style? Depends on where I'm at. Okay. It's weird. Like if, <laughs> like if I go home and I go to a crawfish bowl or crabs or shrimp, it, that's what we do at home. Everybody yeah, boils you have it. to. That's just the way they otherwise. do it, right? Yeah. But up here, if I'm going to do it, I'm steaming it, you know, and, and I want it where I am, you know, that's that's what I'm going to do. But I love the Old Bay seasoning. It reminds me of Tony Shashery's seasoning at home. It's very, very similar. And so, look, when I first came to Baltimore, I felt like I'd die and go to heaven when it came to food, you know, because oh, yeah. my, my favorite thing is a nice cold beer and a crab cake, too. Like, like you so can't, Maryland does. Oh, you can't beat a crab <laughs> cake now. That's, that's right at the top with the crawfish. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I want to know a little bit about your playing career is wrapping up. When did you realize, okay, I can do this broadcasting thing. I want to get into that. And was coaching on your mind? And what kind of motivated you to stick with broadcasting, maybe? You know, I, um, I never graduated from LSU. I never went back to school. I was in broadcast and journalism uh, when I was at school. But I only got in five semesters. Like, I, I went all my first year all my sophomore year, and then the Olympics came calling, right. and I went to the Olympics in 88. Well, we got back from the Olympics in 88 so late that the fall semester had already started at LSU in 89. starts in August. We didn't get back from the Olympics until, like, mid-October. Oh, wow. So they said, well, Ben, you qualified academically. You get to take the semester off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, to hear what 21-year-old yeah, goes, exactly. what semester off? Are you kidding me? So... <laughs> So for November, December, like I'm off. I ain't doing nothing but just kind of working out and hanging out because I'm already eligible for the final semester. Right. And so I go my final semester, and I only get in five five semesters. That's all I get in. And, of course, the Orioles came calling, and, and like, I, I never went back. And so I played nine years at the big league level, and then, uh, you know, I got home and started coaching my daughter in fast-pitch softball, and that went about five, uh, five or six years, I guess. And then, uh, you know, Skip Burtman, the legendary college coach, came to me one day and he's like Ben you know what you need to be doing I was I was like what's that coach I said I'm coaching my daughter and my son I'm starting to coach he goes no he said you're great at coaching but he said you need to be broadcasting Mm -hmm. I was like coach I've never broadcasted anything in my life I have no (laughs) idea he said oh you'd be great just talk about the game whatever I went whatever so he called Cox Cable at the time which was carrying LSU baseball games and he said I got you set up call this guy right here I was like okay whatever so I call a guy but sure enough I start doing like 12 games a year only LSU games on CST Cox Sports Television mm-hmm. well I didn't keep score like I didn't know anything I just talked about what the game was about and what was going in the game what the pitcher was doing the hitters and that's how it all kind of began and then like a year later ESPN calls up and they put me on a super regional uh in Baton Rouge <laughs> like I mean well, I went from here to like right here like super yeah. regional on ESPN it was like whoa but I realized then that uh, you know, it's like anything you do, you evolve and you say, okay, 
I'm pretty good, but I got a long way to go because I wasn't really ever coached to do it. And so I started kind of figuring things out on my own and like, okay, now I got to keep score. Now I got to be a little bit more. I got to know a little bit more about this, this, and this. And so it just evolved. And then it goes from that to the SEC network got kicked off about seven years ago and they called up and I started doing 60 events a year with ESPN. And that's evolved to the College World Series, what I'm doing every year now. And of course, the Orioles came calling about 10 years ago and got in with those guys just kind of on the radio at first doing stuff here in Baltimore and that's evolved into more TV stuff so it's been a learning process on my own I, I look I've been very blessed to work uh Lynn Rollins uh, out of Baton Rouge does all the LSU stuff it's just a legend a gym uh you know I got to work with you know Jim Hunter here Gary Thorne here Joe Angel probably my favorite guy to work with doing radio here some years ago learned a lot took a little bit from all those guys on how to call a ball game uh, never watch myself back. I, I've really? never, I've never, never ever oh. watched hmm. one of my stuff back. I don't know. I don't like my voice for some reason. Like yeah, I can't yeah. stand to hear it. I yeah. don't know if that makes sense or not. Oh, but it makes sense to me. I yeah, know yeah, some people <laughs> that, that watch, they go back and watch everything they do. And I'm like, no, I, I don't want to be like that. I want to just kind of call it off the cuff. Although I feel like I am more prepared about what's going on in the game and each team and each individual player. But I just feel like that I want it to be new every time. I don't want to remember this. Although I do look at games that when I'm over and like every Everybody doesn't go, I could have been better here. Uh, I thought I did a nice job here, but I thought I could have been, I could have made a different point right here, you know, but still at the end of the day as an analyst is to try to keep it simple. And I'll tell you one quick story about that. My, about my third year of doing CST stuff, I ran to an older lady in Walmart in my hometown. And she said, you're, you're so-and-so. I said, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I am. She's like, you know, I don't watch baseball games, but I like watching baseball games when you're doing them. And I said, well, if you don't mind, please tell me what you like <laughs> about what I do because I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out. It's just right. my third year. And she goes, you keep the game simple. She said, when you talk about the game, I understand what you're saying. And I went, wow. Like, it was like a ton of bricks hit me in the head. I went, you know what? That's always going to be my approach because if it's somebody like you two guys that really know the game, I might bore you a little bit. But I'm going for the person that's turning that TV on for the first time and they're watching the Baltimore Orioles and they're going, okay, what is this baseball game really about? Hey, I understand what this guy is saying. He's keeping it simple for me. So I've always had a simple approach to the game on how I wanted to kind of relay the messages to the fans. I know we're in a world now where we're talking about spin rates and exit velos and all this <laughs> expected this and i do dabble in that because this is the world that we live in now but at the end of the day when i call a game i want people to understand what i'm talking about i want to keep it simple as i can and i think that resonates with most folks so it's clear you've learned you know a lot throughout your own experience in the broadcast booth one question we had on facebook whether it's it's on the field when you were pitching or up in the broadcast booth how much have you learned from jim palmer a lot you know, you know, it, it's good to share information with Jim. I listen to Jim. Uh, Jim's an, you know, Jim is one of the smartest guys I've ever been around. His memory. Oh, it's insane. Is a yeah. memory yeah. like I have seen on no other person. And I remember I thought it was a joke. Like when I first signed with the Orioles and I went to my first spring training, or it might have been my, right before my first start at old, at old uh, Memorial Stadium here, I run into Jim in the clubhouse, you know, and – he walks up and he starts talking. He said, you know, I remember my first start. You know, it's 1967, about 82 degrees out. You know, Clemente was coming to the plate and beautiful lady in the third row. You know, wind was kind of blowing out of the southeast. There were six pigeons sitting on the flagpole. And so I'm looking around like somebody's punking me. Like, all right, where's the camera? Like, this guy's jacking with me. But the memory, like he remembers every – I can't remember what I ate yesterday. And Jim can remember what pitch he threw to Clemente in 1970 or whatever. You know, yeah. like, you know, he had a really good breaking ball down on the way. It was a good one. I got him out with a fastball at the time inside before. And I'm going, are you serious? And so he amazes me. But I do pick up stuff from Jim. And when I listen to certain other guys do a game or I work with other people, there's certain things that you pick up. And I'm like, I like the way he, I like the way he delivered that, you know. And so – you want to kind of do your own thing and have your own calls and your own little things, uh, but also you listen to other people too to try to pick up on some things that I think resonates well with people. But Jim's taught me a lot about broadcast, and he's like a big brother to me. You know, he, and, and it's not just about baseball. I can bounce anything off of Jim because uh, we're close enough friends. We talk all the time on the phone. I, I uh, text him all the time, and so it's not just about baseball. It, it's about life matters, you know, and that's what really matters for me about Jim. We got an impossible question here from a YouTube viewer. Who was your favorite teammate? And maybe another way of asking is, 
maybe an underrated teammate of yours. Or you can give us a few so you don't yeah. single yeah, anybody Yeah, I out. mean, there was a few guys. Um, Chris Hoyles was a big buddy of mine. And, of course, pitchers and catchers seem to relate well. So we had a lot of the same interest off the field. You know, he was a big hunter. He liked the outdoors like me. We could talk about hunting and fishing all the time. And so you tend to gravitate – towards people like that uh Cal Ripken Jr. of course we touched on that I felt like he he recognized my struggles or early in and the pressures that were upon me when I came to Baltimore and he was the first guy to kind of put his arm around me probably my biggest friend in the game of baseball is Rick Sutcliffe a guy that changed my life in a lot of different ways taught me how to be a professional taught me to stand up in front of this thing right here when you had a bad outing and 30 <laughs> people stuck it in your face and say be a man don't make excuses that was big when I was 22 years old, you know, and I, and I learned that to say, you know, this game, he said, we don't make excuses. If you were bad that day, you say I was bad. You say I'm going to be better my next time out, but I stunk it up today. That taught me a lot because I still see in our game today, you'll see certain guys step to the mic and, and try to make excuses, and that's one, one thing he would never allow. And I think that helped me grow too, and I, that was a message I pass along to younger players, even some of the younger players in the Oriole Clubhouse right now. You know, step up and, hey, when you stink, say you stink. That's okay. People respect that. Mm -hmm. People don't respect if you make excuses, but they will respect you when you say, look, I stunk it up today, but I'm going to be better my next time out. You know, so Sut was really big for me. Our 92 team here in the Oriole, Oriole early years at, at, uh, at Camden Yards here, Mike Devereaux, Brady Anderson, they're just a special bunch. And, look, I told somebody uh, this the other day at a luncheon that we had. This team out here right now feels a lot like – the 92 team uh, that was a young bunch trying to feel their way at the big league level, hungry to have success, had been beaten on a little bit the, the previous few years, but also a very close bunch that, 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 that really gelled really well together. So a lot of similarities between the 92 team and what I'm seeing today. So I've got a question that we could not let you get off this podcast without me asking. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how much you look at Orioles Twitter, but uh, the flat top haircut, is is quite often a point of discussion on Orioles yeah, Twitter. I have seen that the little memes and what yeah. people do, yeah, you know. Yeah. And actually, it's getting kind of long. I called my barber here in uh, in Baltimore the other day. Of course, he's on vacation, so it's a little longer oh, than man. I want it to be. So, so how long have you had the flat top for? Whoa, is my question. I, I'm going to show my age now, but I graduated <laughs> high school in 1986, and I was going. And I had longer hair, but I was going to LSU to play basketball and baseball. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be two a day in it between basketball and baseball. Because, of course, I went to LSU on a basketball scholarship, not a baseball scholarship. Right. And I said, you know what? The heck with the longer hair. I need something short that I can run and get in and out of the shower. I'll be practicing basketball <laughs> in the mornings and baseball in the afternoon. So I need something to short where I can just towel and go. And so I went to the flat top in the summer of 86. And believe it or not, Whatever year we're in now, 2022, it's still a flat top. The only thing different, it's a little bit thinner on top than what it was many years ago. And, you know, my son's 21 now. Uh, he was just up here in D.C. He spent the summer in D.C. as an intern, interning for Senator Kennedy out of Louisiana. But, anyway, wow. he's had the flat top for about five years, too. <laughs> so, so the other one that's a big topic of conversation on Twitter is your, uh, your how about you that you always say on right. broadcast. You, you when know, did that start? It just came out of my mouth. Like, unfortunately, a lot of things just come out of my mouth sometimes. But when Johnny Means threw the no-hitter last year, I mean, Scott Garceau made the call and it was over. And I, I just went, how about you, Johnny Means? You know, and it came out of my mouth. And so Jeff Arnold uses it from time to time now. Brett Hollander does on the air. They they tell me that they, they use it. And, and I don't know where it came from, but – I don't know. It just what came out of my mouth at the time. It, well, it's caught on. I, yeah. I, I think it's got to be the Louisiana thing. It's like I the, think so. There, there's a lot of that that, that I bring. Like you know, the go Tigers. Go, yeah, go Tigers. But that, that, <laughs> that, that would be Ed Orgeron. You know, poor Ed. Ed's no longer uh, coaching anymore. And uh, but it was a good run that he had. You know, national yeah. champ. But yeah, you know, there's a lot of things I pick up on, and you know, some funny things like when somebody throws a good change up. You know, I'll say that thing. He's got that thing dancing like a minnow in shallow water. You know, I just learned that because fishing. <laughs> You see minnows flicker on top of the water, and right. it just came to me, you know. And there's other things that I've I've said on the air, like um, 
and I've had a few of these. Other people have too. Like somebody threw a breaking ball. And I said, man, that's about as dirty as a bourbon street martini. <laughs> you know, and I've had a bourbon street martini, but that's yeah. just certain things that come to mind when somebody throws a really nasty pitch. I'm like, oh, that's dirty. That's as dirty as a bourbon street martini. And so I don't know. It's just some Louisiana stuff that, that comes out. But, you know, that's who I am. I like being who I am on the air. Uh, like I said, I've never really been coached. I just kind of picked it up and learned along the way, like you guys do a little bit. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it comes out natural like that. And I always want it to be natural. I don't want it to be robotic. You know, I just want to tell the folks what I'm seeing at home. And I, and more importantly, I want to have fun doing it because baseball is a kid's game. We know that you catch it, throw it and you hit it. We've always said that. And it's a fun game and I always want to keep it fun. And the day I'm not having fun doing it is when I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. So I was reading this article recently. It was on the athletic and all the Orioles starters were asked to if they could take one pitch from another starter, mm. what would it be? Yeah. So I'll ask you, as a former pitcher, you know, some said Bradish slider, maybe it was uh, something from Lyles, but what comes to mind is that one pitch that uh, is dirty as a Bourbon Street martini, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Man, there, there's a, you know, I, I tell you what, I would start with Felix Bautista's 103 mile an hour fastball. Yeah, like if you yeah, if you want to stick your chest out a little bit and go, I throw a hundred and three. By the way, I mean that's a pretty good start. Um, Tyler Wells's changeup can be really ni nasty. Uh, Kyle Bradish's slider, mm -hmm. I'm with you on that one. That's a real nasty pitch too. Um, <clears throat> Dylan Tate's changeup can be really, yeah, really good. Yeah. A lot of good changeups yes. on this team. Right? But, you know, and that's yeah. a good point because the changeup has evolved over the years. In my time, we threw the changeup to be hit, but not hit on the barrel. Like it was a pitch to contact type pitch. That changeup's evolved now to where we're turning it over so much they're creating the old screwball, kind of like Fernando Valenzuela threw many years ago. And it's evolved into really one of the best strikeout pitches in the game now, you know? And so it, it's evolved from the mid-90s to, okay, you're going to hit it off the end of the bat for an easy fly to, whoosh, you're out. I'm throwing it with two strikes, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah, like there's – Joey Crable's got a great changeup too. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, we got some good changeups on this team, you know? And so uh, th those are probably the three or four that, that really stick out in the front. So, Ben, I got one more question for you before we let you get out of here. Uh, a really good Facebook question, and again, probably a very challenging one, is, as the commenters here are really throwing heat at you. <laughs> we are tasking you with making your all-time Orioles starting pitching rotation. Wow. Ooh. Oh, man. Yeah. They're throwing yeah. heat in the comments. This is here, tough, ben. you know, because I didn't see – McNally, Cuellar, Palmer. But, I mean, that team where you had, what, 420 game winners. Yeah. On, I mean, look. Yeah. I mean, of course, Jim Palmer, at that point. Jim Palmer's got to sit at the top of right, it, right? right? I mean, he's there. But, I mean, the numbers McNally threw up, Cuellar threw up, Mike Flanagan was unbelievable. Now, Messina's going to be there. Yeah. Messina yeah, yeah, is that. Look, I played with Messina. Messina played in an era that was an offensive era mm -hmm. of – extra boost along the way for some players if we want to say that some performance enhancing stuff that we we saw um and you go back and look and look the batting averages back in the mid 90s were about 265 they're like 25 30 points less than that right now more home runs back then than what we're seeing in today's game so it was an offensive era back in the mid 90s and moose put up those kind of numbers so he's going to sit right there at the top too yep. but if I go in Oriole history off the top of my mind, and I didn't see some of the best of the best, but got to be Palmer, Messini, and then Cuellar, McNally. Who am I missing? Um, Is it Flanagan? Flanagan's in Flanagan. there. Flanagan won a Cy Young. Like, he's in there, too. So, it's been a lot of great – because that's what I remember, you know – it wasn't until I was 15 years old we uh, we actually got cable vision in Denham Springs, Louisiana. Like we had the bunny years going. You got a couple of channels. Yeah. I only got to watch Monday Night Baseball as a kid growing up. Only when it came on Monday Night Baseball, many way before you two were born. <laughs> but but in, in then we finally got cable vision, and it was just National Leagues. I got WGN, WTBS, so I never got to see the American League games. But the Monday Night Baseball I did, and I remember about a little bit of history of the Baltimore Orioles. But it's funny when I first signed with the Orioles, I knew two players. I knew Cal Ripken Jr. because everybody knew Jr. Right. nationwide. And I knew Greg Olson because Olson had pitched at Auburn University in the SEC. Wow. I pitched against him for two years. So, but other than that, I didn't know anybody because I just didn't get a chance to follow the American League like I wanted to, you know. And so, that, but, but made some, some wonderful friends. 
Well, Ben, we won't take up too much more of your time here, but thank you so much for joining us and giving us all of your insight. And Mass and All Access podcast will be back next week, unfortunately, without Ben McDonald. (laughs) But you can find us on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcasts, you can get the Mass and All Access podcast. I'm Brendan Mortensen. He's Tim Leonard, and that's Ben McDonald. We will see you next time.